Well, hi, and uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar, uh, Fall Protection Plans Meet Theatrical Reality, with Phil Van Hest. Uh, Phil Van Hest provides rigging, fall protection, and heavy equipment instruction in the LA area and for bigger hammer production services. Welcome, uh, Phil, and thanks for coming back and joining us today. You bet. Thanks for having me, Christine. So what's new in your life besides uh, getting busy again? Um, well, you know, I didn't have that much hair to begin with. But after I cut all this off, it's, I'm actually a little bit colder from day to day, I've noticed. <laughs> um, so if anyone has a spare hat, please send it to me. I, well, in California, that must be tough. I've been wearing masks on top of my head to try to, but it's, you know, you run through three or four masks a day that way. And, you know, you can only do laundry so often. Um, things are crazy down in Southern California. Um, the entertainment industry is rearing up out of the tar like some ancient mammoth trying to escape the clutches of COVID-19. And um, it is wild. It's the Wild West down here trying to get labor for shows, um, trying to make shows happen. Um, the mantra uh, has been, yes, we can do our best in response to uh, do you think we're going to get this show done? Yes, we will do our best. That's what we've been doing. So trying to get new people out into the field safely is also a big point of concern. And uh, accidents are already up. You know, you have a lot of less trained people or a lot of people who uh, have forgotten how to do everything, all trying to do it all at the same time. And uh, since you asked, Christine, that's how I'm doing. Excellent, Phil. Glad to hear it. All right. Well, what's your presentation for us today? Oh, that's it. Small talk. Okay. Yeah, we're doing. Uh, <laughs> we're just, Sorry, <laughs> they didn't come here to hear me talk. To you, coming so. in hot. So, this is uh, going to be a fall protection overview. Uh, this slideshow is the one that I provide to all of our incoming climbers, riggers, and. Uh, group B type two, three MUP operators, that's snorkel and booms to the uninitiated. And it is qualified as an authorized user training. So we'll talk more about what that means. And I apologize, I have no idea where uh, everyone is in terms of their fall protection career. Hey, Ed, <laughs> nice to see you. So uh, Ed, you keep me honest, let me know if I've skipped over anything. But any place that has a fall protection program in place, um, and that would be any venue or company that requires employees or subcontractors to expose themselves to a fall hazard, need the fall protection plan, and you need to provide authorized user training for anyone who's going to be using fall protection equipment. Um, and that's what this is. That's uh, So this is what I give to our employees um, when they come on with us, regardless of their training status. So if anyone has questions during the presentation, just type them in. Christine will interrupt me. I've instructed her to interrupt me as often as possible. I don't want you to have to wait till the end to get your questions in. So let's get them in as they come. I'm going to not dawdle on things. Uh, I don't want to assume that you know them or don't know them. So if you'd like me to go more in depth, just stop me and say, could you explain that? Or can we talk about that more? Um, and whether you're a person who's never been in a harness before or whether you are someone who's recently been tasked with managing a fall protection plan or even inventing one from the ground up, um, I've been there. So if you want to talk more afterwards, if you have more specific questions about how to create a program, what are the contents of a program, what do they need to be, what do I have to do, what's going on, uh, you can always email me and I'll be happy to um, tell you everything that I know for, for whatever that happens to be worth to you. But when I was, uh, before I knew anything, I leaned on everyone and I uh, am happy to be in a place to be leaned on now. So lean away. And with that, uh, let's get moving with this uh, slideshow thingy. Uh, how are we going to do that? Let's see. Sure, this is the way it'll work. There's a lot of laws and rules about fall protection. Um, go look them up. 
Oh, if you want this slideshow after, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to share the slideshow with you. It's available online, um, 21 anytime. I'm also not going to re. Uh, this is a slideshow that I give to people online, also assuming that they will be taking it um, without the lovely me to guide them through it. So I might skip through a couple slides a little quickly because they are in place for the online uh, solo student community, not necessarily what we're doing here today. Yeah, when is fall protection required? Well, anytime there's a fall hazard. And those are uh, defined legally, but if, and we're gonna talk about uh, we're going to get into the theatrical end of this because some of the fall hazards in a theater um, may not even meet the legal minimums, but they are fall hazards nonetheless. So, you know, you get into ocean, antsy, deep enough, eventually you realize that there's lots of rules, uh, but ultimately we're just trying to protect people from harm and injury. And so if you feel like it is a fall hazard, it probably is. So this slideshow, uh, these are the uh, the levels of fall protection training. So we're at the very bottom here doing an authorized person overview. And that is the definition. The next step up, which is a two day, eight hours a day course is competent person. Um, of course, recommended for everyone. Lovely way to spend weekend. And then after you've been through all that stuff, you may be uh, able to confidently manage a fall protection program as the program administrator. So I'm the program administrator for Bigger Hammer uh, Fall Protection Program. And then a qualified person is a magical ethereal title bestowed um, by oneself upon oneself at some unknown period in your career when you have amassed enough hours of experience or enough um, academic degrees of expertise to be a qualified person. Um, and uh, Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. And really, you you need being aware of your own limitations is uh, the, uh, <laughs> the cornerstone to any safety manager's programs. No, no one you need help. Uh, part of what I'm supposed to do as part of these classes is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I saw the question pop up um, from Parker and yeah, I mean, it's got our branding all over it. Um, you can either sing my praises and use it as is or just use it as a template to make your own. Mine is specifically tailored to the needs of my employees, and they don't work in theaters a lot, but they do work in theaters. So I have a pretty extensive uh, theatrical section coming up. So depending on your uh, workplace, work location, venues, uh, or job duties and obligations, you will you should tailor any program to fit the needs of the um, the employees, staff, students who are going to be exposed to a fall hazard to make sure they get the proper amount of training in the most important areas. Because you know, you run a student through an hour or two of this, it, you want them to at least remember one or two very important things. So, falls, slips, trips, you know, eight hundred ish, eight hundred and nine hundred fatalities. Um, a year, and that's been pretty steady. So transportation incidents are still the top. I tell people, if you make it to work safely, uh, you know, in your car, you've already accomplished the most dangerous thing you're going to do that day. And now here's part two, putting on the harness. You've probably heard of the hierarchy of controls. It's uh, different than Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, but similar in that it is a hierarchy. So this is... Um, more for the manager side of things. When you encounter a situation where someone might need to be put into a fall hazard, uh, be in danger of falling while they're at work, step one is eliminate the hazard. <laughs> you say, well, hey, look, that thing's on motors. Let's just drive it to the ground and you can work on it there. We don't need to climb up there and do it there. We've eliminated the hazard. So that's you know the first thing you want to do. And then uh, two is a passive solution. You install guardrails, safety gates, you cover the floor holes. Uh, this is also known as an engineering solution. You engineer out the problem so that now there's a gate there. Now you can't fall into the alligator pit. Great. Now we're moving in. And, and those two are a preferable, one, because they're the best, and two, because they don't require the, uh, the user, the uh, employee, to 
know anything, right? You don't need to know anything to be stopped by a guardrail. But if we move on into uh, fall restraint, which is the third best option, now you need to know how to put on and fit a harness and to use the fall restraint equipment uh, in the manner that it was intended. So now we involve uh, human error, the capacity for human error and oversight, which is why this is the third favorite option because uh, people people are the worst, you know. You ask them to do something some way and then they don't and then they fall in the alligator pit. So fall restraint is your next best option after the first two. And then fall arrest, we really don't like this one um, because if you are in a situation where you could fall and we're putting you in a harness and a lanyard so that if you fall, you will be caught by the the anchorage and the lanyard and the harness. Now you're just dangling there like an off-season Christmas ornament. And we will talk about this more, but getting someone down out of a fall arrest scenario can be very complicated. And you can also incur many types of injuries in a fall. So we don't like this one. Um, but it is the one that my riggers work in uh, most frequently. So it's the uh, it's the second to last resort. If there's no other way to get this show done, um, and we and we have a safety plan in place, then we will uh, people will agree to go into harm's way and use a fall arrest system. And of course, the least uh, useful the administrative controls because this one uh, relies most heavily on people. Uh, the administrative controls are things like um, a person sitting in a chair um, six feet away from the alligator pit saying, don't go over there. Um, this would be things like a controlled access zone where uh, you see this on roofing a lot where they put a, uh, a string of flags six feet from the edge of the roof. So don't go past this six flags and now you got to train people to not go over there and make sure that the flags uh, weren't uh, defeated by a bird uh, or wind throughout the night. So that's the least. Uh, optimally, we want to eliminate the hazard, and then we want to prevent the hazard from being a hazard with passenger engineering controls. Those are our first two options. And then restraint and follow arrest administrative controls. We'll talk about those things a little bit more. Uh, you know, FYI, uh, there are rules about guardrails and what they need to be to be considered legally a guardrail. Here they are. I made this diagram myself. I, I didn't even use a separate program. I just used the line the line drawing tool available in the PowerPoint app. It was just, just incredible what computers are doing these days. So guardrails. Um, something else, uh, other things may uh, qualify as a guardrail without looking at them, like a parapet. A parapet's just a short little wall, but it could, be, it could qualify as a guardrail. This one at the Poly Pavilion does not qualify as a guardrail. Um, I didn't let him go close to it, but you can see that the para, it's hard to see where it is. I put that red line there, but the parapet is at about knee height. So you could easily uh, back off of the roof over there. And uh, I brought this up to them because it's inadequate uh, fall protection and um, they have yet to build a taller parapet. I know, I'll wait while you all collectively gasp your way into uh, uh, a sitting position for this next bit of information. Uh, skylights must be guarded. Roof hatches got to be guarded and include a self-closing gate. You're seeing these here and there a little bit, but um, I just did another inspection at a high school where I once again explained to them that skylights are just big open holes in the roof and they have to be guarded against uh, students sitting on them and falling through them unless they have some special certification like this is tempered load-bearing glass and will not break maybe then you could get away with it but that would have to be noted somewhere in your plan okay so now we're getting into theaters a, a little bit talking about some uh, common hazards uh, to look out for while you're drawing up your uh, your fall protection plan or when you're at work you know these are things that the uh, Everyone is, you know, deputized as junior safety managers. You have to report these things to someone because uh, despite everyone's well-meaning intentions, this happens all the time. You know, there's a lot of turnover in theaters or um, 
someone uh, who was in charge of the program dies and then the new person comes in and realizes there was never any kind of plan. Now what do they do? Um, you'd be perhaps surprised how often that is the exact circumstance that I find myself in doing these inspections. Um, but a lot of the uh, fall hazards in theaters are so uh, so institutionalized, so ubiquitous, and so uh, they've been there in plain sight for so long that nobody sees them anymore. So some of the uh, places that I find, uh, and of course the most obvious example is the stage apron, the lip of the stage, is often a fall hazard. Um, and uh, we can talk for days about how to deal with that and orchestra pits and what have you, but you still need to have some sort of uh, mitigation plan for people falling off the front of the stage. And still every year, some unfortunate um, ballet dancer goes flying off the apron into the first row uh, of the theater. And we, just, we don't put guardrails up there because everyone understands it would it would really defeat the purpose of going to the theater if there was uh, an OSHA <laughs> OSHA uh, legal guardrail blocking the audience from the view of the show. So balcony rails also. Uh, this is the kind of front of house position, and the lighting is often um, hung out past where you can reach it easily, and uh, a fall protection plan is often missing from uh, the theater when it comes to focusing lights of the balcony rail and of course the torms which are you know uh, downstage of the proscenium walls up and down uh, and they point kind of at a high angle down onto the stage and they look like this a lot of the time there's no tow board uh, there's no uh, the the rails don't exist they're just the, the lighting pipe positions and if the lighting is, if the lighting pipes are full of lights, I suppose it would be hard to uh, fall through them. But when they're empty or sparsely uh, populated, you could definitely fall through there. And even if a person wasn't going to fall through there, which in this case they certainly could, there's no tow rail and there's often uh, gobo frames, uh, sea wrenches, what, what have you, lying around that could easily be kicked off. Uh, with no tow board and land on somebody's head, so it's not it's not always just um, an issue of a of, of fatal personnel fatality, but of uh, injuring audience members or people working on stage. Ladders. We're going to talk. This is like a five slide section on ladders because uh, you may be surprised or. Uh, enthusiastically uh, appreciative to learn that the United States of America leads the world in ladder accidents. Now, it's been a couple of years since I've looked up those statistics, but we were leading by a fair margin. So I think, you know, it's pretty safe to say we're still at the top. Uh, ladders, uh, they're like alligators. You see a ladder, you need to be on your guard because they're one of the most dangerous things you're going to deal with uh, in your in your uh, technical career. So there's a bunch of rules about ladders. Here are some of them now. Uh, the ladders and guardrails got to extend above the level that you're going to. So it can't just stop right at the top. I don't know if you've ever tried to climb onto a roof from an extension ladder, but if it doesn't extend past the roof, very difficult to get on and off that ladder onto that working surface. Guardrails on both sides. These are for permanently affixed ladders. Um, let's see, should I tell say where this is? This this is at uh, Burbank Studios, stage one. Eventually, they're going to get around to fixing this, we, we hope. But there's a few things wrong with this one. Yeah, one is that there's, there's no access gate to the ladder. So, uh, you know, there's no chain. There's no self-closing gate with tow board. It's just a big open hole in the floor. And then the guardrail over by the line set system just stops. It just stops right there. And there's about five feet here where it's just open a hole. You could fall into the, into the arbor system. So just because, and this is this is Johnny Carson's old studio. It's a historical. They still do gigs in there, but you know it's like a museum piece, and um, you never know what you're going to find when you're working up into the in these old places. 
and good luck finding anyone willing to take responsibility for them. So if you're working up there, you have to be responsible for yourself and report these things. It's so fun. It's fun to report stuff. Temporary ladders. Uh, yeah. There's the statistics. Most ladder deaths are from falls of 10 feet or less. It's just... So the way we're going to avoid dying on ladders, we're not going to stand on the top step or penultimate step. The reason for that is um, involves the three points of contact. You'll uh, see uh, this called out in a lot of places, and it's kind of ill-defined. So I'm going to tell you what three points of contact means. It's, it's when you're climbing up and down, Maintaining three points of contact means you need to use both feet and both hands. So you can have three points of your body on the ladder at all times. And you're like, well, how do I work with both of my hands? When I get where I'm going, the third point of contact when you are stationary on a ladder is your body leaning against the ladder. That counts as the third point. So if you're on the top step, you can't, there's nothing else to lean on. You're not, you don't have three points of contact. And if you're on the penultimate step, then, uh, that's not enough distance between your feet and the third point. It's not balanced enough. So that's why you can't stand in either of those two steps. It doesn't allow you for an adequate three points of contact. So you can't carry things up the ladder. You always got to face the ladder while you're ascending and descending and while you're working. You can't turn around and face away from the ladder. If something is more than an arm's length away, you have to move the ladder. You can't be reaching out, leaning over, and uh, uh, what else? Inspect the ladder before you use it. You don't have to get out like a jeweler's loop and a UV light to look for microscopic fissures in the fiberglass. Is it ladder shaped? Like this guy's ladder, you know, most of these things have a little crossbar here. Like, does it have all the bits it's supposed to? Does it look like it will support your weight? Can you put it on level ground? You know, the basics. You, you know, you may laugh, but, uh, uh, don't make me go back to this slide. 164,000 emergency room injuries a year. That means while we've been talking, dozens of people have injured themselves on a ladder. So uh, when it's your job to work up on a ladder, try to have a little more. I know they're commonplace, but have a little more respect for them. Very, very easy to damage yourself on uh, the uh, ladder. So wire rope ladders and other fixed ladders, uh, these are always fun. Um, every every month I run into a venue that has um, an unprotected vertical ladder. All the old theaters have a vertical ladder that just goes 70 feet up with you know no cage, no self-retracting device, no climbing system. Uh, the rule is they can't be more than 20 feet high without some kind of safety device. As a point of interest, uh, the cage, or as we, we affectionately know it, the human cheese grater that goes around the ladder, those are being phased out. They're already, you can't put them in new construction, and by 2034 or 5, all, uh, all cage ladders must be replaced with another system. So usually, uh, one of the other systems would be, like here you have a, a ladder climbing system, so you'd put on a harness and you'd clip your sternal ring into this carabiner there, and then it would track with you as you go up. Or a self-retracting device, there'd be a piece of tie line, you pull it down. Actually, I think, I think I made a little video. I think I made a video. I, you know, I haven't seen this in a while, so I'm gonna, <laughs> let's see what Phil has to say. And this is Phil back when he had like way more hair like from like five months ago okay you got to climb up a ladder whether you're in a studio going to the grid or you're climbing a wire rope ladder up to a truss grid you're probably hopefully going to find one of these uh, pieces of tie line or hand line if you don't and you're going more than 20 feet you need to address that situation with your supervisor before you go up but otherwise Someone has installed a self-retracting device, um, and that's what you're going to pull down. Yes, you are supposed to inspect your anchorage and your equipment before you attach yourself to it. In this case, 
you have to trust that the person up there has installed it correctly. And you can see um, all of the uh, information on the hook that you need to as far as its ANSI standards, uh, meeting its ANSI standards. You can also inspect the uh, impact indicator, which will be showing Oh, sorry. Color in this area, if you if it's uh, been under shock load, and you can also test to make sure that the arrest function is functioning. When you do that, make sure you grip beneath the impact indicator, and that you don't use the ergonomic grip because this is sort of like an odometer, and it's tracking the uh, number of impacts that you put into it. So. Um, if you're going to test it, test from below there so it can track those impacts. All right, now you're ready to climb up. And ANSI says we can put the uh, self-retracting device into our sternal ring if it's going to arrest our fall within two feet. And um, all the Class A and B uh, SRDs are rated for that. So I'm clipped into my sternal ring right here. I can climb up. You can, of course, use your dorsal ring for this as well if you do not have a sternal ring. Wow. I love watching that guy. Is, uh, what a beard. What a beard. Um, this is a fun little chart I put together um, to help people realize why fall protection is important. I think if you're here, you probably understand this already. This is one of those like people who don't believe that they won't be able to just catch themselves when they fall. Like, well, uh, in the blink of an eye, you have fallen four feet and it will be very difficult to uh, rescue yourself. And even if you only fell four feet, uh, you're gonna generate more than three quarters of a ton of impact. So we really don't wanna fall. And if we do, we don't want to fall very far before our gear rescues us. Uh, these are just tips that I give to all of our new people who are coming on board. Uh, good housekeeping is very important because, as I mentioned earlier, um, the eight, well, I don't think I mentioned this, but there's eight or 900 fatalities a year from slips, trips, and falls. 7% of those fatalities are just from slips and trips. Those were the source of the fatality was a slip or trip. So if you're working at height where a slip or trip could result in a much more significant injury, uh, maintaining orderliness of the catwalk and cleanliness of the beams and the working conditions up there is very important. Dust and grease are very slippery. Um, you don't want to trip on a poorly coiled XLR cable and have that on your tombstone. So work slowly and carefully. We work uh, high pressure events, long hours. Um, don't overdo it. And don't let someone else's stress level push you to work at an unsafe speed. And of course, you may not drop things. So let's move on to you may not drop things. Um, ANSI has a new standard. Yeah. 121, let's call it 120, but it's 121 and it's, you know, geologically speaking, very recent. Um, and uh, you can go read it if you want, but here are some highlights. Any who, who's a physics major? Potential energy, kinetic energy. You know, you I have a, a, a crescent wrench at zero inches off the ground, um, no potential energy. As soon as I start raising it up in that scissor lift or that single person vertical mass lift, it is gaining potential energy with every inch that it goes above the earth. So you need to connect all tools uh, that you are using at height to appropriate anchorage. That is the language that ANSI uses, appropriate anchorage. And this is how we've sort of determined what that means. Uh, the strongest, of course, is a structure. Um, the next best would be a an, an appropriate work belt, you know, like nothing decorative and not your belt loop, but the belt itself, you know, and then your wrist. So if I'm using a um, five ounce screwdriver, of course, attaching it to my wrist is fine, or like a small ratchet or a crescent wrench, having it attached to my wrist is fine. But if it was an eight pound hammer drill, 
I don't want to attach it to the structure or something sturdier. So all of the lanyards, oh, it's embarrassing. All of the lanyards um, that you use to attach your tools are supposed to be labeled and rated for an appropriate load. So they'll have a weight load limit on them. And in the last three years, there have been a lot more um, adherence to this standard and a lot more labels on lanyards that you can get for your tools. Is tie line still acceptable? Sometimes. Depends on if you know what you're doing. So if you're not sure what you're doing, um, get someone to help you. So yeah, this is still not in ladder injury territory, but 42,000, there's only 365 days in a year. There's a lot of Again, while we've been talking, someone got hit in the head with something. And it's not even always workers. There was a pedestrian in New York killed by a falling tape measure that someone in the construction site across the street dropped, and it ricocheted off of the building structure across the street. Uh, so they weren't even near the construction site. Anytime you go up with uh, objects, tools, um, you need to make sure that they are secured in some way. Look, I'm so passionate about this. I made an, another slide. Don't mind me. I'm just editing my slides while we go. You, you guys don't mind, right? Um, yeah, hundreds of fatalities every year. Uh, so let's eliminate them entirely and um, have lanyards on all of our gear. This is my favorite, uh, I guess you could say um anecdote about dropped objects and you can look into it if you want if you if you type in you know 1980 uh nuclear accident you will probably find this but the the long and short of it is uh, world war three was narrowly averted because of a dropped socket from a wrench so now uh now it's a rule that if you're working above a nuclear weapon you need to have all your tools tied off and that same standard applies to us in the entertainment industry uh, the warhead did not detonate but the rocket blew up and we had to be on the phone with the kremlin to say it's not a launch it's not a launch it's an accidental explosion so that they didn't think it was a launch and initiate war games is that, was that that movie with um ferris bueller okay so Let's start getting into the nuts and bolts of uh, your fall, uh, your personal fall arrest system, PFAS. You'll see PFAS uh, here and there if you do any real research into the wonderful world of fall protection. Personal fall arrest system has four parts. Four. I'm saying four in bold and italics because the fourth is so often neglected. So the four parts, if you are exposing someone to fall arrest, this is a personal fall arrest system. So you remember in our hierarchy, fall arrest was next to last in terms of preference. And this is why, because it gets complicated. So if you're going to be in a harness attached to anchorage and exposing yourself to a fall hazard where you might fall and require this gear to catch you. That is a personal fall arrest system and it needs to meet these four criteria. It needs to have anchorage. That's rated and labeled anchorage. Body support, which is the harness, which also needs to be, uh, you can't just make one out of twine. It has to be a, <laughs> has to be a, a rated harness. The connector is, is the lanyard that connects your harness to the anchorage and that consists of you know webbing wire and hooks of some sort carabiners or snap hooks and the fourth part that is so often overlooked is of course the rescue plan if someone's going to fall how do you get them down Sometimes it's easy. It doesn't have to be the SWAT team repelling from the ceiling to dramatically pick you off um, while laying down suppressive fire. If, if it's just a matter of bringing out a ladder so that someone who fell can get on the ladder or you can reach them with the ladder, great. If you can reach them with a scissor lift, great. But if you need to employ uh, any type of other more dramatic rescue plan, 
and everyone who participates in uh, in the fall protection plan, everyone who uses a harness, everyone who's exposed to a fall hazard needs to regularly, and that's up to you to decide. I mean, there are some ANSI requirements about it. You need to practice the rescue plan. Because it's one thing for everyone to read through and go, sounds good, and it is entirely different to have to perform the rescue plan. I like to do a surprise rescue plan spot checks where I would put myself uh, in a fall position with my climbing gear, and then I would get on the radio and say, someone has fallen in the theater, um, please come rescue them. And people would be downstairs eating their lunch like, what? Um, and uh, the first time I was up there for a very long time, um, we'll talk more about rescue plans, but um, some more information about this gear. You can't use fall protection equipment for anything else. Everything that you use must be inspected prior to use. There's some other inspection requirements, uh, but for the authorized user, all the authorized user needs to know is they need to inspect everything before they use it. And of course, whenever possible, have someone uh, check your gear for you. The more pairs of eyes you're going to get on it, the better. Uh, believe me, once you start to understand that you're relying on this stuff to save you in the event of a fault, you will appreciate an extra pair of eyes. Oh, man. Jeez, this is just, look at this. Uh, I'm not fixing this for me. I'm fixing it for all of the OCD people <laughs> who are really hoping I'll fix it. OSHA, this is just for the quiz, really. OSHA says your PFAS must limit the arresting force to no more than 1,800 pounds. That's a lot. Um, and most ANSI gear will cut that in half. If you look at your lan lanyards or harnesses, you'll see 900 pounds um, on most of those. And in California, fall arrest, this is for the managers now. On, in California, all fall arrest equipment must be inspected uh, twice annually by a competent person. That's a California rule. So I don't know who's joining us from where, but if you're in California, twice annual. Most other places, once annual, please check all of your local and state regulations for further information. All right, let's uh, dive a little deeper into Anchorage. Anchorage comes in many forms, okay? Um, one of the most important things you could, you're going to be looking for in your Anchorage is a tag, a label. This is uh, probably the most the thing most often missing. If it doesn't have a label, uh, check and see if there is a record of its um, capacity written down in the fall protection plan. But anchorage, whether it's temporary or more permanent, needs to be uh, labeled. Anchorage limitations, uh, one person at a time, please. One person at a time. There are differences between certified anchorage and non-certified anchorage. Hopefully, within your venue, you will be dealing with certified anchorage, which is stuff that has been installed specifically to deal with um, the jobs that are going to be done in that space. Non-certified anchorage is uh, when we're using like building steel to wrap. Uh, you know, if I'm putting an anchor. Uh, a cross arm strap around a building steel, that would be an example of non certified anchorage. And it, it really makes me chuckle every time. The non certified anchorage needs to support 5,000 pounds. And you say, well, how do I know if it's going to support 5,000 pounds? And uh, the answer is, you don't. You don't. You don't know that unless you've seen building engineering. And most times when we're using temporary uh, fall rest, we don't have time to look at the building engineering. So it's something we ask basic level people to do uh, to determine whether uh, something will support 5,000 pounds or not. But uh, the, the way they try to help you understand it is by saying, like, do you think that thing will support an adult male rhino or a, a Ford F-250? If so, then that's 5,000 pounds. It's a lot. Let me know if you have any questions about that. I know I'm being like purposely vague, but honestly, I don't want to give you um, more information that I think is useful. And 
all you need to know as an authorized user is which Anchorage is acceptable to use and which places are acceptable to use um, non-certified Anchorage and to check with your program administrator if you are not sure what those things are. Um, after this, we get into you know how to engineer fall protection systems, and that's much more professional grade. So here, this guy is not labeled, um, and I can almost tell that those bolts are not rated. It's not rated hardware, so I wouldn't I wouldn't use it. Um, guardrails, you can't use guardrails as anchorage. Conduit, pretty much usually if it's circular in shape and it's not a um, it's not a truss, uh, then it's probably water pipes or, or electrical uh, conduit and you can't use it. So it's, if it's a circle shape up in the ceiling, usually you can't, usually that's not, not good for you. Oh yeah, I did. I added, I added um, graded hardware. So depending on what type of anchorage it is, um, the most common you'll see is grade eight hardware. This is most common for fall protection applications. Um, in certain ones, you may see grade five being acceptable, but um, you'd have to check the installation manual. Temporary anchorage. Some of this, they they will all have labels on them. You got to check the labels. Full body harness, you got to, this is a big one. This is one of the things that we're not going to be able to do today. If I was doing the authorized user stuff in person, one of the most important parts is that I show you how to put on the harness, how and where to co connect your uh, lanyards, and how to fit your harness properly. So I don't, uh, if you were all here, we would go through this. Um, but when you're fitting a harness, it depends what kind you have. If you have the cross, the cross, the H style or the Y style, the over the neck. Some basic things I can tell you is that you want to adjust the uh, the belt section first around your legs and hips because adjusting that properly is the most important part. That's what's going to catch you if you fall. The stuff that's going around your torso that's mostly just to keep you upright and not bending in half when you are caught but all of the weight from your fall is going to go into the sub pelvic strap right under your butt so making sure that that bottom part around your waist and your legs is fitted correctly and then adjust the length of the top um, that will save you uh, a lot of time and if you have the wherewithal and it was within the scope and specifications of your harness and you have the technical capacity at your venue, I would definitely suggest hoisting everyone up by their D-ring in their harness to make sure it is fitted correctly and help them to understand why they never, ever, ever want to fall because it is very uncomfortable. I think I'm going to mention this later, but in case I don't, uh, a piece of gear that you want to have or supply with your harnesses when you hand them out is a relief strap or relief ladder, the little piece of webbing that you can buy they're called look they're called relief straps and if you fall you can deploy the relief strap so that uh, you can stand in it while you're waiting to be rescued and relieve some of the pressure in your legs so you don't encounter any orthostatic intolerance uh, and die while you're waiting to be rescued i think we'll talk about that a little more in the rescue section oh this is just a, uh, a, a what's new from 2014 in the full body harness uh, universe. And um, you know what? If you really want to read it, just ask me for the slides. You can read it on your own time. Free fall limitations. Fall arrest equipment must be rigged to limit the free fall to six feet maximum. Um, what this generally uh, means for you as the program administrator or when you're using uh, Anchorage is to keep the Anchorage at or above the level of your D-ring. When you have your six-foot lanyard, you want to make sure that whatever you're attaching it to is at or above your D-ring. That way you're not going to fall more than six feet before the lanyard starts to engage its deceleration protocols. Restraint systems, this is 
part of the quiz that we're not going to take must be rigged so that no vertical free fall is possible. The restraint is a leash. It just prevents you from falling over the thing or stepping off the ledge. It physically restrains you from falling in, from becoming a fall hazard. And work positioning is not really in the scope of today's thing, but must limit free fall to under two feet. Oh, here's a better picture of, uh, I wonder why I put this slide over here. I'm going to blame uh, the PowerPoint keynote connection. So shoulder rings, you're not going to see those a lot. Those are mostly confined space uh, scenarios. But uh, so I, I don't know a, a scenario in which you would use them in the theater, but there are some. So here's a sternal ring. Here's a dorsal ring. And then um, right about here is where your uh, positioning ring would be. Right around your belly button is the positioning, and then your chest is the sternal. And of course, there's some side uh, rings. We also call them positioning rings, D rings. I have ventral positioning. That's where that goes. So that's for work positioning when you're sitting in the harness, uh, positioned in one place doing your work. Connectors, there's tons of them. Look at all these connectors. Rope grabs, carabiners, lanyards, ladder climbing devices. They're, they all have the same requirements. You, you've got to inspect them before each use and they've got to meet minimum ANSI standards. Uh, fall protection um, carabiners and snap hooks all have to be dual action and self-locking. So those are the two biggies for fall protection carabiners and snap hooks. They need two actions to open, and when you let go of them, they have to close and lock automatically. <laughs> I like this one. I think I think C is my favorite. There's another one here. Like, yeah, C is like, don't. What what is this? Look at this. Look, you can't just stick it into the D ring. That's not how. <laughs> but must have happened, or people wouldn't be concerned about it. So some things to keep in mind is that on your D ring, when you're using a fall protection on a D ring on your harness, you can only have. Uh, two snap hooks per D-ring. Some lanyards are not designed for tie-off, means you can't tie them back onto themselves. I think I have a picture of one on the next slide right there. That is one that is built to tie back onto itself. See, it's flattened out like that, so it maintains efficiency on the webbing. The thing has to close when you attach it to something, so you can't just hook it on top of a bar it's got to close fully. You can't connect pieces of fall protection equipment together and daisy chain them. And no carabiner to carabiner action. Okay. When you're using uh, connectors, the shock absorber section needs to be close to you. So whatever end of the lanyard the shock pack is on, that's the one that you attach to yourself. Yes, one, I think I made a little video about that, but this is a Y lanyard because you see it has two legs and they share a single shock pack. So that's called a Y lanyard because it's Y shaped. And this allows you to move uh, from one point to another with, without losing contact with the anchorage. So you're on one anchorage and you can connect to another one. So briefly you're on two and then you disconnect from the previous one and move on. And I, in the video, I'm going to explain the difference, uh, the key difference between the Y lanyard and the V lanyard, because uh, there are some situations in where you may prefer one over the other, but um, functionally, uh, here's a video explaining the difference between, between the two while you're using them. Okay, so we've climbed over the guardrail, and I'm prepared to transfer from this horizontal lifeline 
for this one, I'm using a Y lanyard. So the Y is shaped like a Y. It's got two legs coming down to a shock pack that shares that shock pack. When the leg is not in use, I'm going to put it on your keeper, your little keeper tab. All of the new uh, harnesses have to have them per ANSI. And the reason you put it in here is because if you have a fall, both of these are connected to the same shock pack. And this one, this one lifts up, this one's going to lift up. And if it's connected to this, it'll just break away. But if you have it connected to a structural part of your harness, you're going to get Get hung up and, and bumped in there. If you have a Y lanyard and your keepers are hard to see or you just don't like them, Y lanyards can both be attached to the same horizontal light. With a Y lanyard, one of the benefits when you're walking along and you're ready to transfer from one side to another. They're right there for easy access, and you can carry along your merry rigging way. And go. <laughs> so Mark are, are working in a sound stage where we have to get from point A to point B. Right, I can reach this other lifeline. It's the best path for me to take. I'm going to disconnect from over here. This type of lanyard that I'm using is called a V lanyard, and having it connected into both lifelines at the same time is not a good idea. So I want to get this one disconnected as soon as I can and make sure that I'm only falling onto one lanyard at a time. Where do you clip the unused one on a V lanyard? With a V lanyard, I can put it pretty much anywhere because if I fall, it's not affected by the other side, right? They're independent. Each leg is independent. Oh, man, you got a cameo from the Mike Charnell of Versailles. Incredible, incredible sighting of Mark, Mike Charnell there. I forgot he was in that video. Always good to see Mike. Self-retracting devices. These used to be self-retracting lifelines, uh, and they thought lifeline was giving people false hope. So now they are self-retracting devices. Perhaps you've seen them. Um they come in all kinds of lengths, uh, eight feet, 11 feet, all the way up to you know, hundreds of feet. Um, they're great. I discussed uh, earlier in one of my in one of those videos about the impact indicator when you're inspecting the hook at the bottom of a self-retracting device. If the impact indicator is visible, that means this thing has suffered a, a shock load and needs to be retired and definitely not used. The, the All fall protection equipment is single use, like a paper towel. Once you've used it, you can't use it again. Um, all right, look, you could technically use it again, but you may not use it again. You may not use it again. Uh, it needs to be reported and destroyed and taken out of service and all that good stuff and records maintained, et cetera. Oh yeah, here's that here's that note. Must be dual action and self-locking. Um the gate, here's a here's an important thing about the the carabiners and the snap hooks, both of them. They need to have this 3600 pound uh, uh gate strength listed on the gate itself. It's got to say 3600 pound weight limit on the gate. Like I found this old one here that did not have it. Um, so this one is, you're not legally allowed to use them anymore. The carabiners and the snap hooks have to have the 3,600 pound weight limit stamped onto the gate itself. So it really, it really went for it on that one. Um, they do not have to be steel. They can be made of equivalent materials. We just prefer steel for fall protection because um, it, well, it helps me separate my climbing uh, gear from my fall protection gear. Um, and they're a little more durable. You know, you can use the steel carabiner to whack loose a stubborn <laughs> a stubborn uh, shackle. I didn't say that. No one's doing that. Don't do that with your fall protection equipment. 
So 5,000 pounds along the major axis and 3,600 pounds across the minor axis. Um, this guy uh, could not be used for fall protection because it is a, a screw gate. So you need to manually screw it a lot into the locked position. So that does not close and lock automatically. So it is not acceptable for fall protection just as a point of interest. So the rescue plan. Um, if you've ever hung up in a harness for any period of time, you know that getting down promptly, as OSHA suggests you do, prompt rescue uh, is critical. And you need to develop, maintain, and practice a rescue plan commensurate with the work you are doing in your venue and have a plan anytime someone is going up into a fall arrest situation. This is just more information about why it's important for you to get down. And here's even more information about why it's definitely very important. I promise you, this guy is unhappy posing for this picture right now. This is not cozy to be hanging up by your D-ring in a harness. In any way you can get out of that position, you're going to want to, which, okay, I do have a slide about this, relief straps. So here's a picture. It's This one is the kind of the ladder style, and you can have it in your belt, or you can have it pre-attached to your lanyard. So if you fall, you just pull the, lat, the, the ladder out of that pouch, and then you can stand in it and get blood flowing in your legs and be a little more comfortable while you're busy trying not to panic uh, dangling under the grid 70 feet in the air. If you don't have one of these, and really I can't recommend enough that you just get them, uh, you have to move your legs as much as possible while suspended to make sure the blood continues to flow. Horizontal lifeline systems, some of them have been installed already, and uh, usually the, um, the anchorage with the um, the anchorage with the the decelerating device will be installed in such a way that you can inspect them before you climb out uh, onto them. Make sure you know uh, how many people can be on each section of horizontal lifeline at a time. Inspect it while you're using it. That, that goes for pretty much all rigging and fall protection and climbing gear. Temporary lifelines are a uh, weird gray zone of uh, the, the entertainment rigging world. There isn't currently really a way to implement a horizontal lifeline on a truss that is suspended by motors in a in a hundred percent safe way um, there's a few ways you can um, increase the the chances for success if you have enough headroom uh, something that i've seen is instead of attaching the horizontal lifeline right where the span sets or the gag flex uh, and the shackle meet the motor you put um, a two or three foot or a four foot stinger in between uh, the GAC flex shackle and the motor, and then you put the lifeline up there. So when you're walking along on the truss, your anchorage, your horizontal lifeline, is at or above head height, which is going to reduce uh, the amount of force you generate when you fall off it. Make sure whoever's installing these things knows what they're doing because uh, they often don't, or installing the horizontal lifeline in the past has fallen onto like the lighting department, you know, and they just put it on as, and maybe they don't exactly understand what they're doing. If you encounter incorrect rigging or suspect uh, fall temporary fall protection um, in your place of work, it is your uh, right and your duty and your obligation to uh, point this out to someone. You don't have to be a meanie about it, but you can certainly point out because especially for someone is going to be expected to trust their life to this. So um, there's nothing wrong with asking questions about what it is you're doing and making sure there's a rescue plan. If someone asks you to climb and says, here's the harness, you should say, cool, what's the rescue plan? And if they look at you and blink, you can hand the harness right back to them. Be like, legally required to have a rescue plan before I climb up there. I can't wait to find out about all the trouble I'm causing with this information. Uh, work positioning, we kind of zipped through, but if you are doing work positioning, you do need a secondary anchorage. So this is a uh, secondary anchorage needs to be at or above your dorsal ring. Uh, 
the height of your dorsal ring, and then you sit in the primary. So the primary is actively holding you up, and then you have a secondary in case that should fail. And until you've been 80 feet up in the air, trusting the gear to keep you alive, I you know, you might not understand, like, why is all this secondary stuff necessary? But uh, I promise it's super is necessary. Um, fall clearance. Clearance, clearance. You need to be close to 20 feet off the ground uh, before a fall with a six-foot lanyard is going to help you. So just putting on a harness and clipping into something when you're you know, six or eight or 10 feet off the ground is not always going to be the solution you're looking for. So be aware that uh, clearance heights are required. Know how to calculate them, and that's a whole other thing. If you want more information about this, there's plenty of places online you can go to look up this stuff. But deceleration distance, when you fall, you have a shock pack that unzips when it encounters a load, a shock load, shock pack. Deceleration distance is how long it takes to slow you down, which can be uh, three to five feet, depending on what type of pack you're using. So you want to know what you're using. And of course, if someone builds a stage under you after you calculate the fall clearance, your fall clearance has now changed because there is a stage there now, or road cases, or people, or what have you. You need to make sure you take all these things into consideration. Ugh. Uh, we're going to skip the de minimis uh, thing. This is that that that's a slide I have in there for when I have a lot more time to um, explain how much I know about OSHA and fall protection. Swing fall hazards are, of course, uh, perhaps self-explanatory. They're one of the many reasons that I always recommend having an impact-rated helmet when you're doing any type of uh, climbing or putting yourself in a fall hazard situation. If you have ever practiced rescuing someone, um, it is much more difficult to do if they are unconscious. Also, in many scenarios, you can self-rescue on a ladder or what have you. Also difficult to do with a head injury, so I recommend helmets. And be aware of where your anchorage is and what will happen if you fall and you are connected to something that is six feet behind you. Inspection protocol. So you have to inspect them uh, before each use. You got to remove defective stuff. Here's a big one. If the manufacturer's label is not legible or missing, that counts as a, a fail. You got to fail that stuff. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, people will dig your stuff out of the trash. If you encounter something defective, you have to destroy it. Because if I go dig through your trash and I use one of your garbage uh, connectors and then i i fall and hurt myself you are in the liability circle a brief nod towards the area lift and we're almost done i know we're at at an hour but i have like just a couple more things to get through and we've had no questions so far so whether or not anyone's even still here is up for debate but uh, harnesses are not legally required when operating scissor lifts unless they're required by a company or vendor studio policy or what have you you do need a uh, fall arrest or restraint when driving a snorkel or scissor. Legally, it says, you know, some kind of fall arrest or restraint. I recommend heartily restraint. The reason you need uh, fall protection in the boom lift at all is because of the launching hazard. Um, they're basically a long catapult arm and you can get launched out of them. You can dig up videos online of that as needed. Um, uh, and because it's a launching hazard, you remember the clearances we talked about, you know, 20 feet of 18 to 20 feet needed of clearance. When I'm driving the thing around and I'm only 10, 15 feet off the ground and I get launched out of it, I'm going to hit the ground before my fall protection has a chance to arrest my fall. And then let's say I was high enough up, I get launched out. Now I'm hanging there and someone has to rescue me. Now, what if there's been an electrical failure because of the accident I was in that launched me? I have to use the manual descent option. What if they don't know how to do that? What if uh, what if it's very slow? And I guarantee you, manual descent <coughs> for a boom and snorkel is very slow. So I'd prefer to stay in the basket. Even if I get bonked around a bit, I'd prefer to stay in the basket. So I heartily recommend restraint solutions for operating booms. <coughs> and snorkels. <coughs> I think we just went over this. Yeah, this is sort of like 
my my own CYA. And if you were here, um, I would uh, have some example harnesses, and we would go over how to inspect the webbing, how to inspect the connections, the um, the the D rings, and the stitching. I will. Uh, just as a general piece of advice, tell you that most of the wear on these systems happens where metal touches fabric. So wherever the webbing and the stitching is touching a metal buckle or a D-ring or what have you, generally that's going to be where most of the wear happens. So make sure you look in the hard-to-see places um, so you can uh, find these pieces of uh, defective equipment before they become problematic something i get asked periodically is you know how old can they be before they are taken out of service and there isn't really a, a thing about that they need to be taken out of service when they fail inspection and some uh no one does this anymore there was a company that had a it was a five-year shelf life on the equipment said this must be replaced five years after uh, purchase or five no it wasn't even purchased it was five years after the manufacturing date that turned out to be a bad business model. Um, no one wants those because they have to throw them away four or five years after they get them. And if they don't sell them right away, they're just sitting on the shelves becoming unsellable. So no one's really doing that anymore. Um, if you uh, use yours outside a lot, it's going to deteriorate much faster. UV damage is still um, the, one of the worst offenders. If, if your harness doesn't get cut or ripped or uh, burned, uh, the thing that's going to damage it most likely is um, neglect and leaving it out in the sun, or if you're just yourself out in the sun. Otherwise, if you're using a positioning device regularly, your positioning ring is going to wear because it's metal on metal, uh, or be steel on steel, <clears throat> and it's going to wear out quickly. And once that D-ring has started to exhibit uh, signs of wear like that, and you're not going to want to trust your life to it anymore. You're going to want to replace that gear. So I have a million things uh, to continue uh, talking about. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, as I mentioned, if you want more advice about how to create and maintain a protection plan, I'd be happy to go over that with you. This is a pretty brief overview about the, the life and times of the authorized user. Back to you, Christine. Well, Phil, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, thanks for uh, adding your support to USITT and uh, giving this member benefit to the folks that pay every year for member benefits. We'll see you in Baltimore, right? Yeah, so we can talk about that for a second. Uh, Phil is helping us out, helping the Technical Production Commission out with the ground rigging lab. Um, and that's uh, Ed. I'm doing, the, I'm doing the I'm doing the mechanical advantage uh, and disadvantage lab. Ed, who's on the if he's still on here, he's doing the uh, he's doing the ground rigging portion. Very but cool. We'll be, sharing space. we'll be all up in each other's grill one way or another. Absolutely. We're going to have labs and hands-on spaces in Baltimore. That'll be a 20 by 40 space for ground rigging and mechanical and dis mechanical and, oh, whatever you just said. It's advantage, <laughs> advantage and disadvantage. And disadvantage. I'm calling it the MAD lab. M-A-D. Very cool. Very cool. Well, you got a lot of kudos here. I don't think I see any questions. Um, folks, just so you know, this was streamed on YouTube. So, uh, when somebody asks, can you show this recording to employees or employers, I think it was. This stays on the USITT YouTube page. Um, so uh, thanks again. Um, it looks like we got a gentleman here. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, lots of info here. Is there a link to the slides that had a lot of info? I think we're going to say email Phil. Is that correct? Yeah, just email me and I'll... I can, um... I'll send you I'll send you a link to the presentation. Excuse me. Um, otherwise, you know, you can see Phil again and Ed Leahy and anybody else who might have joined us here today. Uh, many of the folks here in the audience will be at, in Baltimore with us. Um, I have a quick I don't know if it's an anecdote. You, when you organize a class for fall arrest and rescue and uh, Mr. Sapsis is teaching it 
and he tells the person that's hanging in the harness to uh, go limp uh, without making it known to anybody else or the organizer in the room. And I start to freak out because <laughs> he's wow. screaming to get the lift over to rescue this person. And it was like the third time we went through it. So people got a little lax, like, ah, we know it now. We've done it twice. And uh, this person thinks, wow, great. I'm organizing a class that somebody dies. <laughs> I think that's my <laughs> career is over. Thank you very much, Mr. Sapses. All right. Well, folks, I think we'll wrap it up today. Once Phil has a uh, parting remarks. No, right. Very cool. Thanks again, folks. Be on the lookout uh, on the USITT uh, website. We try to offer as many things as we can of all different varieties. So thanks, Ed. Join us for another conversation. Bye, folks. See you next time. Thanks, Phil. See you soon. Thanks, Christine.